Welcome to People, Places, Planet Pod, the official podcast of the Environmental Law Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to ensure a healthy environment, prosperous economies, and vibrant communities founded on the rule of law. Welcome to ELI's People, Places, Planet Pod. I'm Lavinia Reynolds, a research associate here at the Environmental Law Institute. The fourth National Climate Assessment presented a stark picture of the United States' fate due to climate change. And while the forecast is grim, one thing is clear. We need to act now. But with Democrats and Republicans arguing over the virtues and pitfalls of a Green New Deal, and with President Trump's latest budget proposal cutting many environment and energy-related programs, climate change policy in the United States is as divisive as ever. Fortunately, a comprehensive new resource from leading climate attorneys released in March lays out a myriad of legal pathways available to policymakers at every level of government and in private governance to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The book, Legal Pathways to Deep Decarbonization in the United States, details more than 1,000 recommendations covering a range of policy areas to reduce GHG emissions by at least 80% from 1990 levels by 2050. Top environmental lawyers Michael B. Gerard, director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia University, and John C. Dernbach, director of the Environmental Law and Sustainability Center at Widener University, edited the book. The Environmental Law Institute's book division, ELI Press, published the book. Last month, I sat down with Michael Gerard and John Dernbach to learn more about legal pathways to deep decarbonization in the United States. John, thank you so much for joining us. What inspired you and Michael to take on this project, and what do you hope it will accomplish? Michael and I were both reading reports from the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project, uh, which is an international effort to look at technical and economic ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in about 16 countries, representing about three quarters of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, we were really interested in the U.S. reports. And we looked at the U.S. reports and we said, this is really interesting. But legally, what what laws would be employed uh, uh, to get the necessary uh, reductions? And, and, and Michael and I began uh, uh, sharing emails and then talking about a, uh, an edited volume that would be a comprehensive uh, analysis and evaluation of all the different legal tools that were, were, were available. And our thought process was that the the 80% reduction by 2050 would be much more likely to occur if we had a better idea of of what laws and what types of laws might be necessary to accomplish that. An important part of the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project is that it did not identify one single approach uh, to reducing greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050. Instead, it provided four different pathways or uh, scenarios, if you will. Uh, One is high renewable energy, where a great amount of the reductions would occur because of the use of renewable energy. A second was high nuclear power. A third was high carbon capture and sequestration. And a third was some balance of of, of all three, carbon capture and sequestration, uh, renewable energy, and, and, and nuclear power. Uh, one of the important aspects of our book is that we don't take uh, uh, sides on those issues either. The legal options, the 1,500 or so legal options for st- federal, state, uh, and local decision makers, as well as the private sector, are are set up so that whichever pathway uh, decision makers decide to employ the legal options are there in our book for them to use. In our view, what that does is that it provides the broadest possible uh, approach to thinking about what laws and policies might be appropriate and and ought to, in a perhaps more perfect world, provide some ground for people on different sides to find uh, a middle path. Can you tell me a little bit about the contributors who helped work on this book? One of the amazing strengths about the book is the quality of the work that was done by the individual authors. Uh, They they were our distinguished uh, practitioners uh, from from the uh, uh, private sector as well as in academia. 
uh, and it was it was a, a a real privilege to work with them. This is Michael, and I would only add that we uh, had all of the chapters peer reviewed by several people, so this book has gone through rigorous peer review. So, Michael, how economically and legally feasible are the recommendations that this book sets forth? All of them are legally feasible now if we get the right kind of legislation in place. Without legislation, in, uh, without more legislation than we now have on the books, most of them are um, legally feasible, which is not to say that the current administration will carry out the ones that are proposed at the federal level, uh, but most of them are legally uh, feasible under current law at the federal, state, or local level. The book lays out over 1,000 legal options or recommendations. Which do you think are most impactful? Michael, I'll let you answer first. The book makes clear that it's necessary to electrify uh, our current uses of liquid and gaseous fuel, starting with uh, motor vehicles and uh, moving to heating and cooling of space and uh, and water heating. That's going to require a doubling of the amount of electricity that we need. We, In order for that to make sense, we need to have all the new electricity and the old electricity come from clean sources. So one major focus of the book is a massive expansion of the uh, renewable energy generating capacity in the United States and the associated electricity storage and transmission. All of this is expensive, but it pays itself back. It is a, a massive public works program that creates a great many jobs and spurs a lot of economic activity. Uh, I, I have, well, two thoughts on a, on a favorite uh, topic, if you will. One is the authors made clear over and over again that while carbon pricing is important and essential, uh, carbon pricing can't be uh, a is not going to accomplish the necessary reductions on its own. It needs to be supplemented by a, a wide variety of different kinds of measures. And that takes me to my second point. Uh, what was really interesting, I think, about the, the recommendations that the authors made is the wide variety of types of legal tools uh, that, that the authors identified. There are actually 12 different types of legal tools. Additional regulation, of course, is comes up all the time when we talk about this issue. Carbon pricing is a second one. But what particularly intrigued me uh, in, in editing the book was the number of times different authors said that the law is now in the way on issue X or Y or Z. That is, uh, this would be easier to do uh, uh, if, if a particular law was modified that is now getting in the way. Uh, we saw this uh, in, in uh, uh, Michael's chapter on utility scale renewables. Uh, we saw it for distributed renewables. We saw it for hydropower, for nuclear, for financing, for carbon capture and sequestration. That issue came up again and again. And what's particularly interesting about that is that the idea that law is getting in the way has not been part of the mainstream conversation about what to do about climate change. And so one of the things that I rather like about uh, what, what this book accomplishes is that it opens up the conversation to approaches that we haven't thought about very hard before uh, and that we haven't given as much attention to as I think perhaps we should. Michael, now that the book is out, what's next? We don't want the book merely to end up on the shelf. We want the recommendations to be implemented. So, um, this requires the drafting of a great many model local uh, laws, state and federal statutes and regulations. So in order to get that done, we have launched a project to recruit pro bono lawyers from all around the country to do the drafting to implement these recommendations. Rick Horsch, who just retired as a, an environmental partner at the law firm of White and Case, is heading up that effort. Uh, so we're uh, reaching out to and recruiting a lot of uh, pro bono lawyers to help in this effort. And anybody who is listening who might want to pitch in, please let us know. Uh, we think it's important that the uh, uh, toolkit include the uh, the actual legislative language. So if we have friendly members of Congress or state legislatures or city councils who want to move forward on this litigation, we'll be able to hand them language that can uh, quickly turn into actual bills. And John, given the wealth of information and breadth of the topics covered in this book, were you concerned about how to make the book user-friendly so that it doesn't just sit on the shelf? To, to make the book more accessible, uh, we produced it in two forms. 
Uh, one is a summary and key recommendations version of the book, and the other is the full volume itself. The full volume runs 1,100 and some pages uh, and is uh, uh, intended to be a comprehensive compendium of all the different legal choices that are available. Deep decarbonization is a challenging project, and we did not want to do a kind of um, light version of that, uh, uh, that, that that left out a lot of the details. On the other hand, we wanted also to have a, a, a shorter summary and key recommendations version so that people could pick it up and get a pretty good idea of what the main messages of the book are. The second thing that I would say about that is for the big book, we have an index of recommendations by actor, which means that if you are at the, in, working in a state legislature or at in a, for a state public utility commission, or you're working at a particular corporation or you're working in Congress, you can see all the recommendations that are applicable to you in one place, regardless of the chapter in which those recommendations are located. The idea is to make the book as accessible as possible and hence to uh, enhance the likelihood that the recommendations will be enacted. Legal Pathways details 35 different topics in as many chapters covering energy efficiency and conservation, electricity decarbonization, liquid fuel decarbonization, carbon capture and negative emissions, non-carbon dioxide climate pollutants, and a variety of cross-cutting issues. The legal options involve federal, state, and local law, as well as private governance. I sat down with some of the book's contributors to learn more about some of the options they recommend. K.K. Duvivier is a professor of law at Sturm Law School at the University of Denver. Professor Duvivier wrote the book's chapter on distributed renewable energy. So I think most listeners would understand renewable energy, things like solar and wind. But what exactly is distributed renewable energy? Yes, actually, it's very simple. It's probably the quintessential image that people have of a solar panel on top of a roof. That's distributed generation because what it means is that as opposed to the Thomas Edison days or, you know, the Nikolai Tesla actually invented some of the transmission, you're you're generating the power right where you need it. So, you know, as they evolved with the utilities, they went from having things close and they figured out how to get alternating current and transmission lines so they could put those stinky power plants away from the privileged people that were allowed to have electricity and who could afford it. Um, so we've been dealing with that kind of centralized plant and transmission lines, but now we're able to, with photovoltaic solar, generate clean, quiet electricity right where you are using it. What are the benefits of distributed renewable energy? For the utilities, it gives them, especially when you have storage, it gives them um, the capability of having, avoiding transmission losses, reducing cost of building more transmission lines. There's less variability because if they build a great big field of solar cells, which some of the utilities are doing a lot of them because solar is one of the least cost um, forms of generation right now, and utilities are putting them out, you could still have one cloud uh, cancel out all the generation in that one field. That's much less likely when you have solar panels distributed over a wider area of houses. With solar, you can also have uh, microgrids, which are ways of protecting you in cases of emergency. So in California, one of the incentives for going to their mandate was the forest fires. They said, you know, people were without power for a long period. So if they had their own generating capacity or their own batteries, then they wouldn't have been without power. So it's good for security and emergency. It also helps fight cybersecurity threats because there is a huge threat in these big centralized systems. If someone can get in there and hack it, or take down a big power plant, then whole swaths of the country would be out of power. So the distributed generation helps with a lot of those, those issues. Is this the same as going off the grid? We're not recommending that people go off the grid. So the grid is this connection of transmission lines and distribution lines that we've kind of evolved over time. So it's not very well organized, but it does serve us pretty well so there's still parts of the country where people don't have access to power at all, and they're off-grid. But there are more and more people 
whether they're survivalists or, you know, environmentalists that are trying to cut all the tethers from a utility and say, well, if I can generate all the power I need myself, why do I need a utility? I don't necessarily recommend that because in order to um, make it through the whole year, you would need more batteries than um it's not the best use of resources. You would need a lot of batteries to make it through the nighttime or the winter and things like that. And there's so many benefits to having those batteries connected to the grid so that the grid can use that battery power to come in when there's peak demand. What are some opportunities you see in this field? I think one of the most exciting and dramatic things that, that are coming out right now is this building mandate from California. Just last year, Uh, California decided that they would have a green zero energy mandate. And so part of that is making your home more efficient. But the other part of that is what I focus on, which is how do you generate power for your home so that you're net zero? So obviously you're using some power in your home and you can cut down that demand significantly, but you still need some lights. You still need some heat at some point. And so In California now, they're requiring solar uh, for every new home starting next year. So in 2020, every new home in California is going to have to have a solar power system or have some capability of being connected to a solar power system. A couple of other things that I think would be valuable is that the federal government is cutting off investment tax credit for residential solar, but but keeping it for... uh, utility solar, and it doesn't seem to be that there's any good reason to treat residential solar differently from utility solar. So that's something that could be done on the federal level. Then kind of coming down to the state level, and in the United States, up to more than half the cost of an installation have to do with different permitting requirements, different inspection requirements, different building department requirements. So if we could get statewide permitting or standardized permitting either, maybe national would be nice, but at least a few states like Vermont and um, Hawaii have more statewide regulation. Then digging down a little further to the uh, utility level, the utility commission level, some things like that rates, Time of use rates are something that actually reflect the market. It costs utilities different amounts to supply power in the middle of the night as it does in the heat of the day on a hot summer day when everybody's got their air conditioner on. That, That power costs the utility a lot more money. And yet a lot of utilities have been covering that cost by charging a standard rate. Well, if you actually let consumers know what it costs for them to use electricity at a particular time, and then they could use their own generation or their batteries to cut their power use during those times or to contribute to the grid at those times, you're getting a real sense of the market value of distributed solar. Do you see this as a promising opportunity? Yes. Um, my, I'm a huge optimist in the future of solar. The price has decreased 70 to 90 percent in just the last decade. I also am excited that individuals uh, have more and more power to control the use of electricity that they're that they um, are able to generate by themselves. And so, like having a cell phone or maybe a laptop computer at the time, it didn't make a lot of sense. Maybe when laptops first came out, people were saying, well, it's cheaper to have a desktop or a centralized computer, but people wanted their laptop because it was convenient and it gave them all kinds of new capabilities. And now we see that evolving to a cell phone, which has so many more capabilities than anyone imagined. So I'm very optimistic that that energy generation with photovoltaics and storage are gonna go maybe not as fast, but a similar path and people will have the more and more choices. So right now you have all of these uh, layers of government and all of this tradition that's standing in the way of adoption of solar. But as we get improved technologies, so they could be like a plug and play, like a refrigerator, where you don't have to have a permit to put them in. You just buy at the store, you bring it home. I think solar is going to move more and more that way. And so we're going to see dramatic uh, increases in the adoption of these resources as we see move forward. 
As we just heard, distributed renewable energy will be key to deeply decarbonizing our electricity system, and improvements in technology are making great strides in that regard. Another renewable source, and one that is often overlooked, will also have a role to play. I'm talking about hydropower. Chuck Sensaba, a contributor to the book and a partner at Troutman Sanders in Washington, D.C., explains. I think that when most people think of hydropower, they think of the big dam projects that were built uh, in the United States anyway uh, in the 1930s through the 1950s. And, and while that certainly is the case, hydropower is a very broad technology. Uh, some projects these days, for example, are taking advantage of a very low head uh, circumstances in irrigation canals or in water conduits that supply uh, water supply for municipalities, uh, particularly in the western United States. And these projects don't require a dam at all. Other emerging technologies are uh, wave and tidal projects uh, that are considered within the, the family, if you will, of hydropower projects. Uh, and while that's uh, those technologies are still in their infancy, uh, there's tremendous potential for, for uh, developing those projects over time. I recently saw an advertisement for a small device for backpackers uh, that allows for the charging of cell phones by throwing a little turbine in a creek and taking advantage of the flows to, uh, to generate a current to, again, uh, charge electronics. Those also would be considered hydropower projects, so it's a very broad technology. Many environmentalists have not warmed up to hydropower despite it being a renewable resource. How might you alleviate concerns in that regard, particularly with respect to climate change? And are there certain obstacles hydropower faces that other renewables do not? Hydropower has some very unique aspects to it that actually help bring more renewables to the grid than otherwise would be available. Um, it's the concept that power plants have different products associated with them, not just the generation of electricity. And what I mean by that is hydropower by its nature uh, adds a lot of stability to the electric grid. Uh, because hydropower is a very flexible technology, the, uh, the power generators can be switched on and synchronized with the grid very quickly so that, so that the generation can rise and fall with electricity demand on a almost a real-time basis. Whereas other renewables uh, are more intermittent in nature, and that combination of hydropower being able to be flexible with the, the inflexibility or the more intermittency of other resources can work together to bring all of those technologies online. Um, so hydropower has a very important place uh, in the kind of the stack of different technologies that are used day to day and hour to hour to keep the grid on. Um, and, and so that, I think that's where the, the benefit and the value proposition with hydropower lies. Until such time as the, the value of hydropower's products are reflected in the market, and I'm not just talking about the fact that it's a renewable energy resource, I'm talking about the fact that uh, hydropower can be scheduled, hydropower can be stored, uh, hydropower can provide black star capability and other ancillary services to the grid. I think that until those proper signals in the market are, um, are sent, hydropower is going to be struggling to keep up with some of the other renewable resources. The, the big topic that we cover in the chapter is hydropower licensing. Uh, hydropower requires, most projects across the country anyway, a license from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And that's a federal action that triggers a lot of environmental compliance and review, which, of course, is something that is welcome and needed. But the challenge is that, again, from an environmental compliance standpoint, there are more obligations related to hydropower 
because of that federal license that aren't extended to wind and solar, geothermal, and other other technologies. Again, placing hydropower on an unequal uh, footing from other renewables. What are some of the recommendations you set forth in the book? One of the, just a, a couple of examples, I guess. One of the, uh, I think, smart uh, recommendations that we make in the chapter is a recognition that there are there are tens of thousands of dams across the United States right now that are not equipped with with hydropower uh, generating facilities. Uh, there there are dams that are used for flood control or water supply or or other purposes that again are existing infrastructure. They're not going anywhere, and yet. We are not taking advantage of the fact that there's existing infrastructure that could uh, accommodate the development of hydropower. Uh, One of the recommendations that we make from a regulatory standpoint is to prompt the development of hydropower at these existing uh, infrastructure facilities uh, in a way that protects those uh, reasons for which the dam was, was constructed. A second suggestion that we make in our uh, in our chapter has to do with the the approach that federal and state resource agencies bring to the table when uh, there's a proposed project. Right now, all of the uh, players around the table bring their compartmentalized views of what's best for the project in terms of uh, environmental requirements. Uh, the FERC is obligated under the statute to take all of these different perspectives and uh, perform an analysis that the, that the Federal Power Act calls equal consideration of development and non-developmental uh, interests. So FERC tries to kind of balance the scale, but with so many other resource agencies and other interests at the table, that balancing doesn't really work that well. And so one of the recommendations that we suggest is that all of the the decision makers related to hydropower bring to the table that same perspective of balancing resources. And one of those resources that they should really think about is the effect uh, to climate change and perhaps the climate benefits of a project so that those climate impacts can be informed in agency decision making. In addition to deeply decarbonizing our electricity system, the book has an entire section on fuel decarbonization. I spoke to Romani Webb, a senior fellow and associate research scholar at the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia Law School, who wrote a chapter on the production and delivery of low-carbon gaseous fuels. Welcome to our podcast, Romani. So what exactly are low-carbon gaseous fuels, and what is their role with regard to climate change? Sure. Well, The term low carbon gaseous fuels is really uh, a catch-all that's commonly used to refer to more climate friendly alternatives to fossil natural gas. So we know that um, to limit future climate change, the use of fossil natural gas is going to need to be um, largely eliminated because natural gas production is a large source of methane emissions and um, its use is a large source of carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, The expectation is that in most sectors, natural gas will be replaced by electricity. So, for example, we will electrify heating systems to reduce natural gas use in buildings. But in some sectors, particularly in some industrial sectors, electrification um, is likely to be very difficult and, and perhaps impossible. So we need to find alternative fuels that can be used in place of fossil natural gas, which is where the low carbon gases come in. Um, there are many examples of low carbon gases. The, the most well known is probably biogas, which is produced um, during the breakdown of organic materials at landfills, wastewater treatment plants and agricultural facilities. Uh, that process produces a gas that's comprised primarily of methane, which is, of course, the primary component of fossil natural gas, but uh, is also a very potent greenhouse gas. So by capturing the methane, we can not only reduce our contribution to climate change, but also secure a useful energy source that can be used in place of fossil natural gas. You also contributed to the book's chapter on methane. What are some of the recommendations there? 
Well, methane makes a very significant contribution to climate change because while it's emitted in smaller quantities than carbon dioxide, it is much more potent than carbon dioxide. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimates that in the first 20 years after it is released, methane traps over 80 times more heat in the Earth's atmosphere than carbon dioxide. There is, I think, great promise to reduce methane emissions in the oil and gas sector. Um, currently, most of those emissions are the result of natural gas venting and leakage. Um, a number of technologies can be used to reduce gas venting and leaks. And in many cases, the use of those technologies is um, cost effective and can actually increase operator profits. Uh, that's because when an operator reduces venting and, and leaks, it is effectively capturing more natural gas that it can then sell. So one recent study found that uh, methane emissions could be reduced by up to 40% at a cost of just one cent per thousand cubic feet of natural gas captured. Um, despite that, though, operators may be reluctant to voluntarily invest in gas capture technologies for a variety of reasons. Those technologies Technologies tend to have a very high upfront fixed costs and the payback periods can be quite um, long. So given that, uh, having a regulatory framework that requires operators to take steps for to capture natural gas is very important. Um, the good news is, though, that there are opportunities for states to step in and, and regulate methane emissions from oil and gas facilities. Um, there are also opportunities to address emissions through private governance regimes that can be established by industry bodies. We have already seen some of that happening, um, but there is certainly room for further, for further work. Lastly, no conversation on climate change would be complete without discussing agriculture. Peter Lehner, director of the Sustainable Food and Farming Program at Earth Justice, explains. Sure, the agriculture sector is a little different than most of the other chapters discussed in the book because the main greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture are not carbon dioxide, which is, of course, released when we burn fossil fuels. Uh, much of the greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture is nitrous oxide, which is a gas about 300 times more potent to greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And that's largely released by the microbial action on fertilizer that is applied but not taken up by the plants. It then converts from uh, a form of nitrogen uh, that might uh, be useful to the plants to nitrous oxide and uh, where it's a potent greenhouse gas. It's also an ozone depleter. The other major greenhouse gas from agriculture is methane and that comes from uh, cows, their bodily emissions and also from the manure uh, of, of all livestock. There's also a, a major source, a major greenhouse gas is the loss of carbon that is stored in the soil. We can increase that carbon is stored in the soils, but we can also lose it. And when we lose it, it's effectively a greenhouse gas emission. What are some of the strategies available to reducing these harmful emissions? Sure. One of the exciting opportunities that many are looking at is built on the recognition that f fertilizer that is applied that converts to nitrous oxide is fertilizer that isn't doing the farmer any good. Uh, it is fertilizer nitrogen that is applied and isn't going into the plant. Uh, and then the farmer has paid to buy it and to apply it, but is not getting any result from the crop. So better application of fertilizer uh, can significantly reduce nitrous oxide emissions. And on average, in the United States and really around the world, uh, producers often put about twice as much fertilizer as the plants actually need uh, onto their fields. So, and they often do it at times that uh, plants can't really take it up. So between the amount of fertilizer, how it's applied and when it's applied, there are a lot of opportunities to both save farmers money, perhaps uh, feed the crops a little better, but also significantly reduce nitrous oxide emissions. Methane, as I said, comes largely from animal waste and from uh, cows, uh, their enteric emissions. And there are ways to manage uh, manure differently. Right now, a lot of manure is managed in these big wet lagoons where it is held in, in sort of a sludge, a liquid form. And as the manure decomposes in that uh, 
environment, it releases a lot of methane. Dry handling of manure can reduce the methane emissions significantly. There's also thought that some feed additives uh, might be able to reduce the enteric emissions uh, from cattle. So, and then of course there's shifting uh, what we're producing. And in fact, uh, in many parts of the world, there are government efforts to encourage people to eat less beef uh, because of the climate change emissions that come from beef in particular. But what about strategies outside of the farm? For example, do you recommend changes in food production or the reduction of food waste? Sure. Food waste is one of the major producers of methane. Right now in the United States and really around the world, uh, about close to 30-40% of the food we produce is actually not eaten and wasted. And while some of that is composted and then becomes good healthy soil, the vast majority of that is actually in the United States. So as a result, methane released from landfills, which is one of the largest sources of methane in the country, is driven largely by food waste. So if we can reduce food waste uh, in our homes, uh, in supermarkets, in restaurants, we can not only reduce the methane coming out of the landfill, but potentially also reduce the upstream emissions from the production of that food that doesn't do anybody any good. There are also opportunities throughout the whole food chain for, I mentioned earlier, uh, the problems, the challenges of over-fertilization and that fertilizer converting into nitrous oxide, a potent greenhouse gas. Fertilizer manufacturers is also very energy intensive. Uh, so if we reduce fertilizer use, you're also reducing the manufacturer fertilizer, and that would reduce uh, significant amounts of greenhouse gases. But if you think about the whole food production, the whole food system, uh, you the food is harvested, it's often processed, heated, cooled, and, and many others. And so energy efficiency throughout the food chain is actually also a way to reduce emissions from the food system. What are some of the barriers for implementing these practices? You know, many of these practices farmers know are beneficial, and yet we sometimes have antiquated policies that uh, create uh, barriers to them. I mentioned earlier cover crops. Many farmers feel that their ability to get crop insurance, which is a very important federal program to help farmers, uh, could be jeopardized by using cover crops if they don't terminate the cover crop at just the right time, et cetera. Uh, so actually, uh, good news is that in the 2018 Farm Bill that was just signed in December, uh, we hope will reduce that disincentive. Uh, there are also other challenges to changing crops and changing practices. Farming is a notoriously uh, uncertain activity. Uh, in addition to my role at Earth Justice, I manage a couple farms down in Central America, and uh, you can do the same thing. And depending on the weather on the days following what you do, which obviously you can't predict, the results can be different. And so I think we have to recognize that it is different in agriculture uh, how change can come about than in an industrial facility or in a very controlled environment. So you mentioned the farm bill. What other legal strategies do you believe are most promising with regards to deeply decarbonizing agriculture? The farm bill is, of course, the, the major law in the on the federal level that governs uh, farm payments, really. And right now, there are a lot of incentives given to farmers that make many of these practices more difficult. It's harder to have a wide range of crop rotations uh, because of the way the crop insurance system works. And the market, there may only be a, a physical or market for a certain range of crops within a certain distance. So we have to address some of those policies. We're also seeing action at many states that are trying to pass what are called healthy soils laws to try to create incentives uh, for farmers to transition to these practices that have been proven, uh, really, they've been proven around the country, they've been proven at all scales, they've been proven for many, many different crops and, and products. 
to uh, both create healthier soils, which is soils with more carbon, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and in most cases also be more profitable for the farmer. Another angle that I think is important is that many of these practices will also make the producer, the farmer, the ranch, more resilient to the extreme weather that we're seeing from climate change. Soil that has more carbon in it or that is protected by trees uh, can hold more water and thus withstand a drought better, can uh, be more resilient when there is flooding because the roots are deeper and therefore can withstand the shock uh, of the flooding. Uh, can st If their trees are there and on a pasture ground, the cows have an area to uh, stay in the shade and that can make a big difference to not stress the cows so they'll gain more weight and that becomes more profitable. So there's a lot we're seeing that many of these practices in addition to mitigating climate change can help make the production more resilient to climate change. So between more profitable and more resilient, those are incentives for the farmers and shifting some of the policies to eliminate the barriers and to create financial incentives to shift practices through the myriad of programs that are out there, we've got a lot of policy levers for change. Before we go, I'd like to thank John, Michael, KK, Romani, Chuck, and Peter for taking the time to talk with me about these issues. Yet we've only heard from a small handful of contributors. At a recent seminar at the Environmental Law Institute, former EPA Administrator William K. Riley praised the breadth of issues covered by the book, as well as its practical and bipartisan nature. There are many actors who will profit by the information in this, in this book, who will learn from it, use it, and affect improvements as we head toward deep decarbonization. But you've done something extraordinarily consequential. To learn more about the issues and potential solutions addressed in legal pathways to deep decarbonization in the United States, visit www.eli.org slash deep decarbonization. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in to People, Places, Planet Pod, brought to you by the Environmental Law Institute. We would like to hear from you. So please send us your questions, comments, and ideas to podcast at eli.org. And if you're interested in learning more about our work, attending one of our events, reading our publications, or becoming a member, please visit our website at www.eli.org.